Hi, thanks for joining us for That Larimer County Show. My name is Denny LaRue, and I'm the Larimer County Community Information Manager. And I'm Neil Gluckman, Assistant County Manager, and we're here to discuss a very serious topic, the funding of public safety here in Larimer County. And we have some special guests here today to do that. To my right is Larimer County Commissioner Steve Johnson. Hi, Commissioner Johnson. Hi, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. And we have Sheriff Justin Smith here as well. Thanks for being here, Sheriff. Good morning, Denny. Good morning, Neil. Good morning. And we're here to talk about the public safety issue and funding it and the options and why is the problem. So let's get started to talk about setting the context for our viewers. What is the problem? What is the issue? You know, the issue that we have with the county jail is how we fund it as a part of the public safety system. Uh, currently, uh, a portion of the county jail is funded under a sales tax initiative that's set to expire here in a couple of years. So as a matter of planning between the sheriff and the commissioners, at how we go forward, uh, there's a uh, community discussion needs to happen at, at what level we can fund the public safety in the county jail and the best way to go about that. Mm -hmm. And citizens continually tell us that public safety is one of the most important things the county government does, keeping uh, our streets safe, keeping our homes safe for our families and kids. It's, you know, an extremely important function of county government. And a, a lot has been done to, to perform that service uh, efficiently. Uh, but with the loss of this major funding source, um, we can't continue to maintain the, the good level of public safety that we enjoy in, in Larimer County. So a number of alternatives have to be looked at of how we how we can address the situation with these expiring sales tax. Okay, so let's just frame it just a little bit more. So approximately 10 years ago, the citizens of Larimer County um, decided on a ballot issue. There was a ballot issue to fund the jail as, as one of the issues. Is that a correct? Actually, mm -hmm. it seems that a short time ago, it was 1997. 14, 14 mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. that the citizens made the decision to fund part of the county jail, the expansion, uh, through that sales tax initiative, and they put a sunset on it and I think wisely so to bring county officials and uh, sheriff's employees forward to explain what we had done with those dollars, how we operated the jail, and give them a chance to reauthorize or uh, make another selection in how the jail's funded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think another wise thing about that sales tax is it not only paid for a 44% a expansion of the jail facility itself, but it also provided operating funds for that expanded portion of the jail. And of course, the expansion is done, those bonds will be paid off, and that sales tax will expire, but the operating uh, expenses of that expanded part of the jail continue to go on, and that's the challenge for the county. With the sales tax expiring, a big portion of the operating revenue for the jail will be going away as well. Oh. So it's, a sunset is sort of like a report card to the citizens. Mm -hmm. yes. This is how we did, and this is how we've been operating over the last 14 years. And then going back as an option because it's time for them to relook at the situation, mm -hmm. the funding. Right. And, and citizens like that. I mean, uh, the sales tax was passed in 1997. I believe some of the previous commissioners have told us a, a measure was tried before that without a sunset and it failed. And mm -hmm. I think Coloradans and Larimer County citizens uh, want to, to keep a close hand on their, their taxes and how they're spent in Larimer County. They want to know they're getting good value for their tax money. One of the ways to do that is with a sunset provision. It forces those of us that are administering those funds on the public's behalf to come back to citizens and say, here's what we've done with, with your money. Here's how we've spent it. Here's what, how, how we've gotten the most efficient use and, and the best results in public safety for the tax money that you've given us. So one of the options that we'll talk about that w may be considered is to extend those sales taxes. Um, and that will give the citizens a chance to see if we've done a good job and do they want to continue uh, expanding, extending the sales taxes if that option is presented to them. Well, let's talk about those last 14 years and you kind of mentioned the efficiencies. What have you done to keep the jail population down? What special I, things I, have I have think what's on? important yeah, is to look at that trend, Neil. Uh, what had happened was we had seen a continued increase in jail populations. Mm -hmm. That was not just a, a Larimer County or a Colorado issue. That's been nationwide. Well, in 2005, uh, at the sheriff's office, we saw 
that was continuing to rise and the question came up, how can we continue to do this? And certainly the answer uh, from everybody was we need to better control that population. We actually got to what we call an average daily population. On any given day there were 513 inmates in the county jail and that was a, a significant increase over the previous five years. And so what happened was uh, the leaders at the time came together and said we need to bring the different players involved here and created what we called the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee. We brought those players together that was the sheriff, law enforcement, courts, prosecutors, public defenders, uh, private attorneys that were involved and said how can we come together and look at best practices mm -hmm. because we need to manage the space we've got we can't we can't uh, just continue to increase and so we made a series of changes the net result is from 2005 to 2010 while the county population went up about five percent the jail population actually went the other direction mm -hmm. ten percent down and so we we saw a divergence and it was because we started to control the jail population, who was in there, how we managed them. So that was that was the step that brought us in that direction. And I can tell you there was no silver bullet. There was no one thing that could be done. It was all of the, the uh, parties that were involved willing to look at best practices, to have some give and take, to make sure the people we put in were the right people to keep in there. Let's talk about some of the best practices. Um, alternative sentencing. What are some of the things that we're doing here in Larimer County? Yeah, ec excellent point, Neil. Um, alternative sentencing is an idea that was brought to Larimer County um, almost 30 years ago. Uh, some people at the time realized you, uh, not every sentence for a uh, misdemeanor needed to be locked up in a jail cell, in a concrete cell with a steel bed, that there was actually uh, other opportunities to impose punishment. And what we have are uh, a lot of work programs in Larimer County uh, one of them is called work ender or midweek program and what that does it takes the minor offenders that are out there and it puts them in a program where on the weekends they come into the county jail and we're put out in work crews so when the citizens see yellow school buses driving around the county and say larimer county on them it's not a school it's one of the services the <laughs> county's not doing um, it's actually work crews that are put out. They do public projects. Mm -hmm. uh, they do a lot of cleaning up of the county. They help a lot of nonprofits. Uh, really provide a labor force to keep our nonprofits working in the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, those kind of programs and alternative sentencing have been very important. Um, we also have a work release facility that allows other minor offenders to keep their jobs, continue working in the community, paying taxes, um, paying their fines and restitution but they have to stay in a, a dormitory and attend certain programs and do things that you know the judges intend to change their behavior. We have ankle monitor programs that take people whom the the courts want supervised but maybe they don't need to be locked up. Ankle monitors can track where people go so those alternative sentencing programs have proven to be efficient and effective at imposing sentences for less dollars, about half the cost of locking them up in the jail but they've also been effective. They change behavior. They bring some of these inmates uh, back on the right track. So let me ask you then, um, if, if they are so effective and at, at many things, a benefit to the community, um, keeping the cost down, et cetera, are, is this being done everywhere? Is this something that uh, across the country? We're seeing others pick up on it slowly. Uh, routinely, we have people come from around the state and around the country uh, observing how we run those programs. Mm -hmm. There's other facilities that will do those, but they'll do them with uh, using a jail environment and deputy staff. We use civilian employees and, and use dormitory style housing. So what we're doing is pretty innovative. We have a lot of co Colorado counties that have much higher incarceration rates in their jail that are coming to us saying, Larimer County, how are you doing it with the dollars you've got? And that's what I was wondering, are, are incarceration rates lower than? They are, and, and actually the citizens would, most people would be shocked to find out that what we call the uh, average daily population incarceration rate, we're about half of what the state average mm -hmm. is. Here in Larimer County, per 100,000 residents, there's at any given time about 155 people locked up in the county jail. So total, that gives you about 470. And the state average is actually 292, almost twice that. The national average is in the 240s typically. So we incarcerate at a lower rate, which is important to know we do it. The question is, how do we do it? Are we doing the right things, the right programs to make that happen? If I could just add, I think one of the things, the reasons this is so important to the citizens of Larimer County is 
the real cost of the jail is not the construction. Mm -hmm. Everybody focuses on what it costs to expand a jail. The real cost is the operation. Over mm -hmm. the life of the facility, I think the operational costs are about eight or ten times what it initially costs you to build it. So how you manage that population is really where value and efficiencies for the taxpayers' dollars can be realized. And the important thing about alternative sentences is the goal is public safety. We use alternative sentencing only where they're appropriate for those individuals that are, are not at risk, uh, risk to society, where that's appropriate, where justice can be served, where they can maybe stay in their job, continue to earn money, pay taxes, support their family, but come back to the detention center at night. And it is much less expensive, as the sheriff mentioned. But we've been able to do these things because of the level of funding that we have for the jail right now. And we have those alternatives for the judges to sentence people to. If those alternatives are not there, if the level of funding is not maintained for the jail and we can't have those alternatives in place, then the judges won't have those alternatives and they'll be forced to sentence people to the jail. And again, that's about twice as expensive. And so over the long run, that really is, is very inefficient and very expensive for the taxpayers if we don't, don't have some of these alternatives available and where appropriate. And those are the sales taxes that are expiring Correct. right now, the operations? That we're using to okay. operate the jail, yes. Daniel, let me give you an idea of some other things that we've done right. as these best practices were explored. Uh, not only do we, we have more of the work programs, but we use a lot of inmate labor within the jail. And there's an expectation the inmates will keep busy working and doing things to maintain the jail. Uh, one way for most citizens to best relate to this is by using inmate labor in the, in the kitchen. They put out almost 2,000 meals a day for the jail and for community corrections and alternative sentencing. Using that inmate labor, we're actually able to feed them for less than most people would spend on a cup of coffee. Uh, and they stop on the way to work and, and buy that cup of coffee, it's about $3. For less than $3, we're able to feed an inmate a day uh, on those three meals. So uh, inmate labor does those things for us. It keeps uh, laundry up, keeps the facility clean. Uh, inmates are expected to do those things and maintain the jail. Um, that's been a, a significant part, just under $2 million a year inmate labor is used in the jail. Um, we've also looked at, at one of the programs that I think was the biggest aha moment is it's a private sector idea and what it was is to take uh, people that are out on bond that are awaiting trial and uh, it's called a call uh, a call reminder program mm -hmm. and what they do is the same thing your dentist or my doctor do you've got that appointment six months down the road there's a good chance in six months you may not remember your, your appointment, so you'll get that phone call a week ahead of time. Neil, remember, next Thursday, 8.30, you've got a dentist appointment. Are you gonna be there? Neil answers the phone and says, yes, I will. <laughs> Much better chance the doctor knows that Neil's gonna show up for that. Mm -hmm. We have the same thing uh, with yeah. the, the call reminder program, and we use some inmate funds to do that. In one of the courtrooms, we saw an almost 40% reduction, what we call failure to appear, them just not making the court date uh, months down the road. And what that means in true impact is if they fail to appear, the judge issues a warrant. The local police or the sheriff would arrest that individual. They'd bring him back into the jail. There'd be a new criminal charge that would be prosecuted by the DA's office, really all for a technical violation. We found out if they'll make that simple phone call, much higher chance that they'll, they'll show up for court and not back up the jail. Uh, we also run programs. Uh, yep. I'm and, sorry. And that program, the call notification, mm -hmm. is funded by the booking fees, it's, I believe, It's right? funded by booking so fees, so inmates essentially pay, pay for, for that program. Already, yeah. And it was just an innovative idea to say, how can we do it smarter and not stack those, you know, those individuals up uh, by putting more in the jail? Uh, we've also looked, and the, the community recognizes mental health problems are a serious concern in our community, as they are in all, but those have also permeated jails, that we have people partially because of their mental health issues that may commit minor offenses and end up in the jail. Um, one of the things that's been done in Larimer County is to have a mental health program. It's called the AIM program. And the net result is we use mental health professionals from the community uh, to help the inmates, not only in the facility, but once they've left, whether that's counseling or some medications they might need. The net result of that is a significant reduction in those with mental health issues showing back up in the criminal justice system, back in the county jail. 
um, because they committed offenses and they, when they weren't getting their help. So morally, it's just the right thing to do. If you have folks that have serious mental health issues, let's try not to put them in the jail. If they commit a crime, we'll deal with it. Um, we also deal with uh, DUIs. DUIs are a problem in every community, drunk driving. Um, we have a specific court in Larimer County, and that court still imposes punishment, but it recognizes that some of these individuals, these offenders, have alcoholism issues. We can lock them up in the county jail, put that time in, but if they, if they don't change the behavior, they'll be back out in a menace on the road. So we have a court that helps to change those behaviors. And so it sounds like there's a wide gamut of programs that uh, the county, all these agencies working together, have come up with small things like the call notification to bigger things like alternative sentencing programs to create these efficiencies and, and reduce the funding so that you can keep your incarceration rates lower. Um, so we've talked about the problem and some of the things that are being done. So what are the alternatives for funding this operating uh, sales tax that's going away? Mm -hmm. Right now, the sales taxes that are expiring uh, fund about 27% of the operating expenses to the jail. So if those sales taxes expire and they're not extended, the options would be, well, one, one obvious option would be to extend the sales tax if the citizens believe that what we're doing is getting good value for tax dollars, is maintaining a good level of public safety in the community. That might be something the citizens would want to consider if, in, in possibly extending the sales taxes. But if the citizens didn't want to extend the sales tax, and the other options would be uh, we can reduce jail funding by 27 percent. So, and I'm sure the sheriff can talk about the effect that would have on a lot of these programs that have been efficient. Um, we could um, cut other parts of the county budget by 27 percent and transfer that and totally fund the jail out of the property tax, which I think from a policy point of view would not be a good idea. Number one, the jail would have just one type of funding dependent on it, and plus the the loss of, of other county programs in transportation and road maintenance and public health in uh, human services um, would uh, be pretty devastating to a lot of the programs that the county is, is current, the services the county is currently providing. Well, why don't you kind of talk, address that issue? What would happen if you lose 27 percent? Well, I, I can tell you the county jail has taken um, cuts as the budget has, has uh, decreased over recent years. We lost 16 staff at the jail and what that meant was a net reduction. The citizens paid for a building that we can't fully utilize right now. We had to reduce the number of inmates and if we had a cut at that level it would be a significant impact. Um, we would see it, it, probably even higher proportion of the jail beds just not available and you'd have a vacant uh, housing areas where if we didn't have deputies you couldn't put inmates in so we would reduce the number of people in the county jail. Uh, one of the difficulties with that is because we have such a low incarceration rate we have a high concentration of those who are more dangerous to the community so what we would have, I, I like to explain to people criminal justice is a three-legged stool. It sits up because you have law enforcement, courts, and corrections on three legs that should be pretty equal. Right now that stool is able to sit uh, a pretty level, but if you cut a good portion of that funding leg off for the jail, that criminal justice system is not going to be effective. It's not just a jail issue, it's a community public safety issue. Local police, they could solve crimes, but if they couldn't arrest people and book them into the jail, or the courts couldn't sentence people into the jail, really the integrity of the system uh, thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, the true net effect is the, the safety that the citizens experience in the county certainly could be jeopardized. Mm -hmm. And we started out with the saying that this is a problem. It's not a county commissioner problem. It's not a sheriff's problem. This is a community problem. Mm -hmm. It's a public safety community problem if, if we can't have the system and all three components working in harmony. Mm -hmm. So what if the commissioners didn't uh, cut funding to the jail? what else would you have to cut to find the funds to keep operating the jail? Well, we prioritize all of our service areas and services in the county, so it's pretty easy for us to tell where we'd have to draw the line. We, we uh, split services into high priority, medium priority, and lower priority services, and we know to, to achieve the 27% cut in other services, we'd have to eliminate all of our uh, low-level services, about half of our medium-level services as well. And that doesn't yeah. mean they're unimportant. Right. 
it just means that on the on the bigger scale, you, there are some things you have to do. And, right. And I mean, citizens continually tell us that public safety is the is, really is the number one and most important thing is to feel safe for their families and their homes mm -hmm. and in their community. But there's no doubt if that you know that if we had to cut services, or you had to cut services, it's going to have an effect on, right. on the citizens of Larimer County. Yeah, and, and, the, the and one, of the, one of the ironic mm -hmm. reasons for that is because the sheriff has done such a great job of running the jail so efficiently, there's, you know, there's just nothing else there that you can cut without seeing right. a, a deterioration in public safety. Exactly, right. It seems pretty unprecedented, too, um, from, from what I've seen, that all these agencies are working together on mm -hmm. this issue. It's not mm -hmm. just, as Neil said, a, a jail issue or a commissioner issue, but you've got the courts right. involved and probation and, and all these different agencies. The citizens, yeah. yeah, the citizens in our region can be very proud that the local levels of government, and that really is city, county, and state, have come together here. Uh, we're amazed when, when Steve and I will be out talking to other counties and going to meetings, how many of them say that they don't play well together? In this county, in the interest of community safety and public safety, these entities, uh, these different partners come together, and it's, it's not just that we come together, but there's a willingness to give and take. There's some of these, uh, some of these changes have happened, have been difficult on the sheriff's office, difficult for the county or for the jail staff, but they needed to be done. And there's others where it's a little more difficult in the courts. They had to change ways, but um, everybody really comes together willing to try different things. And, and some of them they've, we've tried over time, didn't prove out, we went back to the old ways, but there's others that we, we realized afterwards were a smart change. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about different funding um, options. Can the commissioners dedicate funds for public safety and, and not use it elsewhere so it could only be used there? Yeah, we, we can with the sales tax. Um, the county currently has four sales taxes uh, in effect, um, and they're all dedicated to specific purposes. One is dedicated to open space. One is dedicated to the ranch and the fairgrounds. Uh, the other two are dedicated to public safety needs, so we can do that. The other advantage to a sales tax funding a portion of the jail is instead of just going to complete property taxes, which we would have to do if the sales tax expired and wasn't extended, is that it diversifies the funding sources. If you depend on just one funding source uh, and the economy affects that funding source, um, you, you feel the full brunt of that effect. The other advantage of a sales tax is the visitors that come to our community, mm -hmm. and they do use the public safety system. They benefit mm -hmm. from it, and unfortunately, sometimes they're in, involved <laughs> in it. Um, they, they can help pay for a part of that. If, if we don't have that sales tax support, and if it's just property taxes, it's just local residents paying okay. for, and not visitors paying for public safety. Have you um, talked to citizens about uh, the whole notion of what's going on, this problem, and, and what have they reported back? We are. I, yeah, yeah. I, I think that was important. As this issue came up, uh, I began discussions with the commissioners um, this year, and their first question was just that, Neil. What do the, mm -hmm. the citizens think? What are, they think we're doing the right things. Uh, some surveying was done to try to get a broad uh, amount of feedback, and it was interesting, uh, overwhelmingly, in the 70 to 80 percent, the citizens in the different questions really came back as, as we talked about what things were done not only in funding the jail, but how we administer those funds. 70 to 80% and most of the questions said, we think you're doing the right things. We, we think these programs are important, that you're focusing on uh, holding them accountable and locking them up, making them work, but also getting them the help that gives them an opportunity to change their ways, reducing recidivism. Uh, the citizens were, were very uh, supportive of that. And I think it was that, along with their willingness to, to look at the potential for uh, other funding sources that brought the commissioners forward to say, let's explore those options because the public has told us they think you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the public's telling us and, and very clearly that they want this level of funding maintained. They want these alternatives. They want public safety to be a priority uh, in the community. Um, the jail has cut 16 positions uh, in the jail. The, the citizens do not want to see further cuts in, in the jail that would risk public safety. So, I mean, there, Another thing that was interesting, and one area they explored was whether the citizens mm -hmm. wanted to see cuts in other services mm -hmm. just to fund the jail. Mm -hmm. And and the numbers were, were uh, pretty strong as well, saying they thought that would be a mistake. Mm -hmm. As Steve mentioned, the things that are low level on the, the priorities for the, the county aren't low level services from a citizen's perspective. These are important things. It's just 
as you prioritize the spending, these are ones that had to fall a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the jail, um, we're not only just talking about the jail, we're talking about, pub, uh, we're talking about alternative sentencing, what you talked, you mentioned, mm -hmm. how we do that. Also mental health, right? Yes, the mental health services that go along with a certain uh, portion of that inmate population. And we believe it's important that when you have people that are in the jail or in these programs that have those issues, the studies definitely show if you can provide that help that the chance of them coming back into the jail it greatly decreases. And one of the things that we do, we work with organizations like the Larimer Center for Mental Health. Outside providers are professionals. We bring them in sometimes using grant funds to work not only with the inmates when they're in the facility, but it's that tie when they're released because they may do well in the jail, but when they're released, if there's not a support network, if there's not the assistance out there, the chance of them sort of falling back into the old problems greatly increases. So by working with, with professionals, and there's a lot of others in the community we work with, they help to stabilize mm -hmm. those folks so that they can be productive, they can be happy, and don't end up committing the offenses mm -hmm. that might bring them back. So you look at the whole person, and it is a very comprehensive program. It's not it, just you're locked up and goodbye. Ab absolutely. It's, it's not just when you're imposing the punishment, but are you doing the things that change behavior? Because we certainly can, can safely and securely incarcerate people in this county. The question is, when they're there, are we providing an environment and the opportunities that help them and support them in making the change? It'll be up to them. But if we're just simply uh, locking them away, what we have to do is warehousing, and we know as soon as they go back out, they're going to reoffend. We bought some time for the public. They're not offending when they're in jail. But once they leave, if they go back to it, we didn't do the right thing for our community. We can change behavior. We're doing the right thing. We're, we're decreasing crime in the future. So as the budget uh, process continues and uh, the budget is adopted in December of 2011 of this year, um, there's some um, big decisions to make how to fund all this because some things you have to fund and some things are discretionary, but you have to mm -hmm. ultimately make those budget decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. And, and the good thing about working in Larimer County, and I worked in the state legislature's budget before coming here, is our whole budget system is results oriented and results driven. Rather than what are the programs that we have and how do we keep funding them, our budget system is what, do, what does the community want the county to provide for them. So we look at public safety, for example. And then under that, we look at how do we achieve that public safety. We operate a jail, we patrol the streets, we have courts that, that protect citizens and can litigate their concerns. And, 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 and we rank those priorities and we measure those. How effective are they? What is our incarceration rate? What is it costing per day to keep somebody in the detention center? And we can fund the, the items, we can fund the, the services that provide those, that public safety, the ones that are most efficient. So really this uh, budget system is enabling us to get value for taxpayers' dollars. All governments are in, in these times are dealing with less revenues and increasing demands. And we want to maintain quality services for the citizens of Larimer County, so you have to change the way you're doing things. We have to get more with less. And this budget process has allowed us to do this. Every year that I've been in office, our budget has gotten smaller because we've become more efficient. Okay. Well, it's time to wrap up the show, actually. It's a very quick half hour, <laughs> I hope, for the viewers as well. Um, I know it is for me, so I want to thank Commissioner Steve Johnson for being here today and Sheriff Justin Smith for being here. And, of course, Neil. For being here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to re remind our viewers that, uh, you know, we live in a democracy, and one of the most important things that we have is the, the ability to vote. So I know that we're in a cycle that election is going to come up. Just, want, you know, use your, your right to vote to vote. Mm -hmm. All right. And thanks for joining us today. I'm Denny LaRue, Larimer County Community Information Manager. Following this show, we have a very special video about exactly how the jail operates. So it provides some additional insight into the world that some of us just don't know much about. So stay tuned for that. And thanks again for joining us for that Larimer County show.
the mid-2000s, our jail population went up significantly and realized this wasn't simply a jail problem to solve. It was a criminal justice system, so what happened was it was really innovative to bring the judges, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, police, and the correctional officials together to discuss how we move people through the system and how we sentence. So what we did was to, looked at it twofold. Those who are accused of a crime but not convicted, we looked at which one of those should be in the jail and which ones could be out working awaiting trial. And then for those who have been sentenced, convicted of a crime and sentenced, we looked at all the alternative types of programs. Alternative sentencing, it's an opportunity for offenders to complete their court-ordered sentences in a residential program, but still remain tied to the community through employment, through family, and also to be able to receive whatever treatment they need. So the programs in alternative sentencing are our work release program, which is a residential program. Offenders are allowed out up to 12 hours a day to go to work and come back, and then they stay here overnight. I mean, I did have the opportunity to do less, amount, less time over um, in jail, doing straight time or come here and it was going to be a little more time. I was thinking, well, I've got a job. I'm, I'm kind of on a track to be able to, to progress in the company that I'm currently at. I wanted to make sure that going doing straight time, I was gonna lose everything that I've accomplished up to that point. Another program we have is our work ender and our midweek program. So it's either Saturday, Sunday, or Tuesday, Wednesday. They come in at eight o'clock in the morning. They're assigned to a crew out in the community. We have over 500 agencies that we provide labor and services to in the community. We also have the electronic home detention program, which is more well known as the ankle monitor. We also oversee uh, useful public service where the courts may sentence somebody to go out and do civic projects. They register with us, and then we assign them to one of these 500 nonprofit or tax-supported agencies. They go out into the community, complete those hours, we verify the hours, and that completes their sentence. Larimer County has been very progressive in alternative sentencing measures for quite some time. The recidivism, the repeat offenses are about twice as much uh, if you've just done a straight jail sentence than they are if you have gone through an alternative sentencing program. Uh, that's a significant percentage and Larimer County has been, I would say, at the forefront of designing those programs. Uh, the county jail uh, costs the citizens about $85 a day to put an inmate in. Most of the work programs on average cost about half of that. So the value there is not only are they paying about half as much to impose the sentence, but they also have people working at a job or working in the community instead of sitting in the county jail. Of course, it's not you know ideal, but you know I did what I did, and that's what I'm here. And uh, you know I've still got uh, everything that I can still go do, and you know transition back into life. And once this is all said and done. We calculated 42,000 jail bed days are saved through our work release program, which equates to almost $2 million a year. By reducing the number of people that have to be kept in the jail, we've reduced our incarceration rate in Larimer County. We're about half of what the state average is. So while the jail currently costs the citizens about $20 million a year to run, if we had an incarceration rate similar to the rest of the state, we have about a $40 million price tab for running the county jail, so a significant savings there. A lot of folks in the criminal justice system have co-occurring problems. They may have a, a drug or alcohol addiction. They may have a mental health problem, all of which are probably very much related to their criminal behavior. We serve those that have severe persistent mental illness, things like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, things of that nature. It's a one-stop shop. We administer their medications here on site. They do three to five groups a week. They have individual therapy, basic needs, housing, benefits, those sorts of things, probation meetings, as well as any kind of crisis intervention that they need. In 2010, we had about 35 clients. In the year prior to sentencing, they used about 3,700 bed days at Larimer County Detention Center. For those that successfully completed their sentences, they used zero bed days in 2010. So those that completed in 2009 did not re-enter the system in 2010, which is pretty, pretty amazing. The lesser offenders are more likely to be in an outside work program. So while the number of inmates is down, 
it has created some more behavioral issues because we have more serious offenders and that changes the dynamic within the facility and makes it a little more challenging for staff. Over the last several years we've done things like upgrade video monitoring systems within the jail. It puts extra eyes out there for the deputies and it really helps control inmate behavior with less staff. Inmate workers do just under two million dollars worth of work offsets in the jail. They completely run the food service. Inmates actually run the laundry system and we're in the process of doing what a lot of folks in the community have done at home and replacing inefficient old appliances with newer appliances. Uh, utilize utilities at night instead of during the day at the peak hours has saved significantly as well. So by doing a lot of little things like that, those are really beginning to add up. But one of the best things that we've done that's been a real value is to utilize a call notification program where we do what your dentist office does. Uh, we make calls uh, to those who have court and remind them of that court date coming up. If they miss a court date, uh, the judge is required to issue a warrant, which really starts things over and puts somebody back to the system. And if we can avoid that and ensure they show up for court in the first place, it saves everybody. Ultimately, this is about the community. This is about what is best for the community. Uh, and what is best for the community is not to have repeat offenders, uh, not to have recidivism, to, again, have the appropriate amount of punishment weighed against the appropriate amount of rehabilitation.